God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please join me in singing our gathering hymn, Gather Us In. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory 
to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise Let us pray. Generous God, your son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We hear God's word. Our first reading is Numbers 11, 4, 6, 10 through 16, and 24 through 29. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout the families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a suckling child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I'm not able to carry all these people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, Put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, 
Gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Josh, Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold. Sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. Come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins, let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. The second reading is from James 5, 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. 
Are they among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if any among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise. Yeah, Lord, to whom shall we go? Hallelujah. You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, as we now ask that you open our hearts and minds to your word, that we may hear and learn, as in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Today's gospel reading brings us face to face with some of Jesus' most challenging teachings. It's a passage that makes us uncomfortable because it deals directly with the seriousness of sin and the radical measures we must take to avoid it. Jesus speaks to us not only about avoiding sin in our own lives, but also about the importance of being a positive influence to those around us. This is a call for each of us to examine our lives and to ask ourselves, are we leading others toward Christ, or are we leading or placing stumbling blocks in their way? Now, in this passage, one of Jesus' disciples complains. They've seen someone casting out demons in his name, 
and tried to stop them because, well, he was not following us. Jesus, however, responds, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. This response from Jesus challenges a mindset of exclusivity. The disciples were concerned that someone outside their immediate circle was acting in Jesus' name. We might find ourselves in a similar situation today. Perhaps we look at other congregations, denominations, or even individuals within our own denomination doing ministries in ways that we don't agree with. They don't align with our personal view and our personal practices. That church doesn't practice what they preach. That church has become way too commercial in how they worship Jesus. Or at least, they don't practice what we preach. It's easy to fall into a trap of thinking that our way is the only way, the right way, that we hold the exclusive rights to Christ's ministry. A lot of people have said in the past that Luther had it right, but that didn't make him 100% right. Jesus' words calls us to a broader view of what it means to be his followers. This passage teaches us that disciples, and by the extension all of us, must recognize and affirm good works done in Christ's name, even if they're outside our immediate community or outside of our understanding. The Spirit moves where it will, and God's work is not limited by human boundaries. That is the interpretation from the Interpreter's Bible in 1954. This inclusivity should encourage us to work together with others who are also doing God's work, doing it in Christ's name. And instead of viewing them as competitors, we should see them as co-laborers of God's vineyard. This attitude, if we can choose to accept it, will not only strengthen the church, but also set positive examples for others. When we show that the body of Christ is united in its diversity, the world will see us striving together for the kingdom of God. And in this passage, it gets even more difficult because Jesus continues with a stark warning. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better if you, for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. These words are striking and harsh, but they underscore the seriousness with which Jesus views our influence on others. In Luther's large catechism, he warns against leading others into error or neglect. He emphasizes that it's not only our actions, but also our neglect that can lead others astray. When we fail to live according to the faith we profess, we risk causing others, and especially those new to the faith or children, to stumble. What does this look like today? Do you have a fish logo on your car, but tend to cut off people in traffic and send up the one finger peace sign? When we are talking about politics, do we dismiss others' comments or opinions because they're not the same as our own? Are we quick to call people names who disagree with us? Consider this example we set in our daily lives. Do our words and actions align with the teachings of Christ? Are we living in a way that reflects God's love and truth? Or do we cause confusion and doubt in the minds of others? Are we leading people away from Christ by our actions? This isn't just about avoiding overt sins, but also about being mindful of how our behavior impacts those around us. 
More directly, how do we handle disagreements or conflicts within our church or community? Do we get engage in gossip, hold grudges, sow discord? If we do, if this is how we act, we are placing stumbling blocks before others. How about when we keep quiet about something because we don't want to cause a stir or just want to keep the peace through silence? If we compromise our values for the sake of convenience or popularity, we risk that same problem of leading others away from truth of the gospel. It's a sobering reminder that we are always witnesses, for better or for worse. Jesus' next teaching in this passage is even more dramatic. He says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. He continues with similar warnings about the foot and the eye. He continues with similar... Jesus is not advocating self-mutilation. He really isn't. He is using hyperbole to stress the importance of removing sins from our lives, no matter what the cost this passage is understood to be emphasizing the necessity of radical self-denial when it comes to sin. We cannot afford to be complacent. If there is something in our lives that leads us into sin, whether it's a habit, a relationship, or even seemingly harmless activities, we must be willing to part with it. The stakes are eternal. While we are justified by faith alone, we are also called to daily repentance and renewal, striving to live according to the Spirit and not the flesh. This process of sanctification is not easy, but it is essential. So we must ask ourselves, what in our lives is causing us to stumble? What are we holding on to that we know is leading us from God? It could be something as overt as a sinful behavior or something more subtle, like pride or a refusal to forgive. Whatever it is, Jesus calls us to cut it out of our lives decisively. Jesus concludes this passage with a teaching about salt, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can, it, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. Salt was used in the ancient world in Jesus' time, not only as a seasoning, but also as a preservative. It symbolized purity and covenant faithfulness. For Jesus to say that we are to have salt in ourselves means that we are to, to live lives that preserve the truth of the gospel. The Augsburg Confession speaks to the role of good works in the life of a believer, emphasizing that they are the fruits of faith. Our good works do not save us. Jesus did that. But they are evidence of the faith that does. They are the salt that flavors and preserves the gospel in our world. So how do we maintain our saltiness? I think it's important that we attend regular worship. We make prayer more than just a Sunday activity. We study the scripture, participate in Bible studies, be active in our faith community. By engaging in acts of love and service that reflect God's grace is how we do the salting. It might be doing landscaping around the building because you have skills in that fact. It might be participating in one of our ministries, the food pantry, our Monday meal. Heck, participating in Jeepers Creepers as a, a participant or a person in charge of some aspect of the event. It might be setting aside funds to support the ministry. It might be inviting a friend. You've talked to them regularly, but for some reason, you haven't brought up your church family. Take a moment now and invite them to be a part. Invite them to come on Sunday. 
Join us on a Monday for a meal. Be a part of our ministry. The lessons today are many, and the challenge is clear. We must live out Christ's teachings in our everyday lives, and we ask ourselves, well, how do you do that? I have four things to tell you. First, we need to take seriously the call to self-examination and repentance. This isn't a one-time event, but a daily practice. We need to be honest with ourselves and with God about the areas in our lives where we are falling short. And when we identify them, we need to seek his help in removing those stumbling blocks decisively. Second, we need to be mindful of the influence we have on others. Whether we realize it or not, people are watching us. They are looking to see our faith in action and how it makes a difference in our lives. Are we leading others toward Christ or are we placing obstacles in their way? This is especially important when we come into contact with those outside of our church family. Are we demonstrating the love and grace of Christ or are we coming across as judgmental and hypocritical? Third, we need to strive to be salt and light in our communities. This means living out our faith in tangible ways through acts of kindness and service, through speaking truth and standing up for what is right, even when it's difficult. It means being peacemakers in a world that is often anything but peaceful. And finally, we need to support one another in our journey. None of us can do it alone. We need the support and encouragement of our fellow believers. When we are down, we come here and allow the others to lift us up. That's why it's so important to be part of a church community where we can hold each other accountable and lift each other up. Let's take these words to heart. And may we, by God's grace, lives li live lives that reflect the love and truth of Christ to everyone we meet. Amen. Please rise and join me in singing where across the crowded ways of life our hymn of the day. and plan. 
throngs up I know tread the city streets again till all the world shall learn your love and follow where your feet have trod Living together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. Pray for the people of God in all places. Shape our witness to the good news of Jesus that we joyfully share your transforming love with all who come in contact. We pray for the healing of the earth. Renew oceans and seas, marshes and estuaries. Uphold the work of conservationists, oceanographers, and all who care for fragile ecosystems and habitats. We pray for peace and cooperation among local and global communities. Bless the efforts of community organizers, international aid workers, and all those who work for justice and peace around the world. Merciful God. In my life, We pray for all who are in any need. To all who grieve, bring consolation. To all who are weary or lonely, bring solace. By your grace, make your presence known among all who call to you for healing, especially those impacted by Hurricane Helene. Aaron, Sherry, Scott, Mike, Betty, Melba, Sammy, Regina, Cheryl, Shirley, George, Chet, Marvin, Terry, Patty, Bill, Mike, Amanda, 
Monica, Sue, Jean, family of Rick, family of Marion, family of Noreen, family of Lynn, family of Zachary, and those whom we now name aloud or in our hearts. We pray for this congregation and for all who are gathered. Be present among anyone who cannot be with us today. Be with all who are hurting, grieving, or ill. We pray for caregivers, doctors and nurses, home health aides and counselors, and those who care for loved ones. Sustain them in their work and help us to build a health care system that supports all. Merciful God. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God. In the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's take a moment and share that peace with one another. morning guys this little song I have picked especially for Virginia and George it comes from the Middle Ages but it's send me back my heart
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 
Amen. God Almighty, God most merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Amen. Please join me in singing our sending hymn, O Jesus, I Have Promised. Now go in peace. Follow Jesus. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.